Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Alberta Transplant Institute's um, seminar series. We've got a very exciting, very interesting talk to present, uh, to have presented to us today. Uh, this is about precision medicine and transplantation. And we have potentially two speakers here today, um, or only one. Uh, our second speaker, Dr. Ruth sapir Pichazde, might be tied up in a clinic, in, that, in which case uh, Dr. Paul Kion will take the reins himself. But these are both co-leaders on a Genome Canada uh, program called Precision Medicine Can Prevent AMR, the AMR standing for Antibody Mediated Rejection. And so this is basically a program that looks at how we can apply precision medicine technology in Canada to prevent antibody mediated rejection and premature kidney transplant loss. So very exciting, interesting science coming out here. Um, and so first up, we have Dr. Paul Keown, um, who's a professor in medicine and director of immunology at the University of British Columbia, with an appointment in medicine, pathology and laboratory medicine. And Dr. Keown is the program leader of this particular program, and he's going to oversee all aspects of this research. Research. Um, he's going to work towards improving donor recipient matching by determining uh, the ALI class one and two epitome frequencies in the Canadian population. So basically how we can apply these precision medicine technologies to increased efficacy and efficiency in donation. Um, in addition, Dr. Kiln will lead the development of rapid, accurate, and sensitive tests for epitome matching and immune monitoring in transplant patients. Dr. Kiln will also work towards the development of pharmacology models to allow for personalized treatment of transplant recipients. So super interesting stuff. If we have time, um, or if Dr. Ruth is able to join us, um, Dr. Ruth sapir Pichazde is based out of Montreal at McGill University. Um, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Nephrology, and the Faculty of Medicine. And she's also a clinical scientist at the Research Institute of McGill University Health Center. She is a co-project leader alongside um, Dr. Paul Keown and I think Brian Sterling as well at UBC, as well as Timothy Caulfield at the U of A. Um, and so, yes, they're here to tell us all about this program. If you guys have some questions as they brew, you can either put them in the chat or wait till the end and just raise your hand and we'll uh, have a nice Q&A at the end of this talk. Or I'll pass the floor off to you, uh, Dr. Keown. Thanks very much, Alessandro. It's great to it's great to see everybody again. Patricia, Laurie, great to see you. Sandra, I see your name there. Great to chat. And thank you very much for inviting us to give you an overview. Uh, I understand from Alessandro and Patricia that there's a sort of mixed audience, many scientists, physicians in transplantation, some others from not so strictly scientific background, social sciences. So I'll try and cover some of the highlights of the different areas of the program. And if there are questions, we can move more deeply into each of the areas. So this particular program was set up to look at, as Alessandro has said, the problem of antibody mediated rejection. And the consortium brings together, as I'll show you in a moment, a large number of universities and principal investigators across Canada, the US, the European Union, and the UK. You see some of the important participating universities there, and we'll mention some of the companies as we move forward. Ruth sends her apologies. She is uh, deeply engaged in uh, saving lives and alleviating suffering this morning. She may be able to join us for the latter half, in which case I've left some of her slides at the end. If not, we can talk about some of the work that she's doing towards the program. And for many of you will know Ruth, but in case uh, you don't know her, this is her uh, in her office in McGill. So let me start with the problem. And the problem is one that you in Alberta have really defined so well. Phil and many of the others have been working on the question of antibody mediated injury for a long time. And largely from your data, we've come to recognize that this is one of the leading causes of graft failure. So uh, for those not intimately involved in the area, on the left-hand side in the cartoon, kidney failure or organ failure in general begins to supervene, organ function declines. In our case, in renal failure, it diminishes to dialysis. Then the transplant is performed. The EGFR renal function proves to, let's say on average, 60% of prior function because we're only putting in one kidney. It remains stable for a period of time, but in the vast majority of people over time begins to decline due to a variety of causes. The leading one having been in the past and is certainly an important one at the moment, antibody mediated rejection. On the right hand side is some modeling that we did with Adrian Levy and uh, his team here at UBC when he was with us. Uh, and this models the 
US data looking at the graph failure over time. And so you see the top line is that those who achieve the greatest graph function in the beginning with the EGFR of greater than 60%, even in that group by 15 years post-transplant, less than 50% of the graphs are functioning. If you start with a poorer EGFR, then of course the outcome is very much worse. So we lose a vast number of graphs you see above uh, the approximation. Few graphs survive beyond 10 to 20 years. 500 patients in Canada lose a graft every year with an estimated incremental cost of around a million dollars if that person then continues to live on dialysis. So the goal of the Genome Canada program was try to intervene uh, and to arrest this uh, premature loss. Given that we have no therapies at the moment which are predictably effective against uh, antibody-mediated rejection, the goal was to intervene early to see if we could prevent it. And we developed four pillars. The first pillar was structural biology related to epitope matching. The second was molecular immunology to improve immune monitoring. The third was systems pharmacology to develop personalized immunotherapy. And the fourth was a social sciences approach to develop evidence-based based health policy and practice. And I'll describe a few of them as we go through, and I'd be happy to stop either during the talk to discuss things, or probably if you prefer at the end. So let's go back to the beginning. The idea here was that each of these would build upon the, formal, the former one. So if we could improve matching, that would theoretically diminish the drive to premature rejection and graft loss. If we could then develop a thermometer or a dipstick or a tool to monitor the immune response, we would have a better understanding of how we could adjust immunosuppression upwards and downwards, which would then lead us to personalized immunosuppression so we could begin to categorize people as at higher or lower risk and adjust or combine the therapies as needed. And then the fourth pillar, which is required by Genome Canada, says in essence, this is wonderful and exciting, but what does the public think about it? Is it a direction we should pursue for Canada? Uh, will patients and providers accept this? And finally, how much will it cost the health systems in terms of economic costs or potentially economic benefits? The first step was to draw together the consortium that would work on this. We have about 72 investigators in 22 universities across Canada, the US, the EU, and the UK. On the left-hand side, you see the composition of uh, groups that came together. So we have representatives from Health Canada, a senior director from Health Canada, and from the FDA, one of the directors from the FDA, uh, all of our major organizations, CBS, HEMA Quebec, uh, the various scientific societies, uh, almost all of the transplant programs across Canada, all of the 13 HLA and genome laboratories, then a variety of more basic science laboratories looking at immune injury, renal pathology, and others as you see going around, uh, to our research partners, who are drawn from global and smaller biotech corporations around the world. On the right-hand side, you see the way they begin to fit together. So we have three sections to the circle. The first are innovator companies, the second global academic expertise, and the third healthcare users and providers. Let me start with that one. So the goal here was to try to bring into the equation patients, caregivers, physicians, investigators, healthcare providers, payers, and policymakers, and as we go forward, we'll describe how each of those has a defined role and works together with us. Among the innovator companies, we have uh, small biotech corporations, large global corporations working in various areas, companion diagnostics, signal inhibitors, cellular therapeutics, biologics, right through to how do we deliver optimal care through distant telehealth and so on. And then in our global academic experts, we bring together the genome sciences teams, proteome sciences teams, clinical pharmacology teams, and others from most of our universities that we describe in Canada and abroad. 
uh, and have built them into clusters so that we can begin to pass information from pillar one to pillar two to pillar three and on to pillar four. So let me start with pillar one, the question being, can we develop an approach to uh, enhanced matching that is valid and feasible within Canada? On the left-hand side, you see the complexity of the HLA genes. So when I first moved to BC in 1987, which is at the very left hand of the x-axis on the graph below, we were just beginning to understand the complexity of the HLA genes. Uh, we had the major gene loci, A, B, C, D, R, D, Q, D, P, but we knew very little about the allelic polymorphism which existed there. So we had, let's say, a few hundred alleles. And as time has progressed, now up to 2021, when I looked the other day, just in preparation for this, we now have over 31,000 alleles at 11 genes, so by a vast amount the most complex genomic system uh, in the human or any mammalian species. So complex that we in fact need a barcode, so just go, like going to the supermarket, we scan, you arrive at a barcode, and the barcode is shown in the insert on the left. So let's say we take HLA-A, it's like a family, the family name might be Murphy, which is the first antigen level, the first couplet, zero, two. And then the next one might be Susan Murphy, and it might be 101. And then we can go further. We can ask more about the complexity of the genomic strands itself. We can ask, are there mutations within this which do or do not alter the complexity of the structure itself? So we can have mutations which uh, create a genomic difference, but don't actually change the proteomic picture. And then they can be expressed to a high degree, to an intermediate degree, to a low degree, or maybe a null in which there's a truncation which stops expression of the protein itself. So these are all complexities now that we have to begin to try and match. So at a glance, you can see that trying to match at the allelic level is a foregone impossibility. The complexity is so great that the numbers needed both in terms of donors and recipients on the waiting list would be so vast that we would have to share, let's say, across continental North America, every organ that we wanted to achieve. And that's just not practical given the, term, the, the sizes of our countries. So let's turn to the HLA proteins on the right hand side. And I often think of the HLA protein as a hand. It sticks out from the surface of the cell and it has a cleft which binds the peptide. And the HLA molecule has one important function in life, which is to present peptides digested from various proteins, self and non-self proteins, to the T cell receptor on the T cell. And that's the communication which forms the basis of most of our major diseases, transplantation, autoimmune disease, oncology, virology, and a variety of others. So this hand now is shaped according to the genomic information which is provided to code the protein. And while we have 31,000 genomic alleles, we have fewer proteins because some of these genomic messages overlap we still have a lot of proteins. But the reason we differ from one another in so-called HLA type is because of the polymorphisms which occur in certain amino acids. And most of those polymorphisms occur around the fingers of the hand. It's almost as though we have different, uh, different fingerprints while much of the rest of the structure of the hand and the arm remains the same. So these are the areas which serve as the focus, the target for the antibody binding. In other words, it differs me from Alexandra or me from Laurie or Laurie from, from Sandra and so on. So the thought arose that if we could match just for these epitopes, it may be a much easier task and would immediately take care of the most important differences between organs. This has been a thought in evolution with uh, Rainy Duquesnoy, Franz Klaas, and many others over the years. So we invited them to join us, and they very happily in, did it, uh, join us. So the question now is, can we begin to decipher the epitopes 
from the genomic information. So this is one of our more recent articles in, in Nature Communications Biology, which takes the population of BC. It takes the patients waiting for transplantation. It takes our last donors over the last several years. Um, we've distilled from about 5,000 fully sequenced individuals, uh, about 2,000 that form the basis for this analysis. And what we've tried to do is look at the allelic frequencies across the population and translate those into epitopes. While we have around 31,000 alleles, they're not all common, so we don't see them all, but we have a vast number. There are only around 150 antibody-defined epitopes, so a dramatic reduction in complexity. And we can take all the alleles that we see, these are class one alleles, class two alleles, and we can distill them into a very small number of epitopes at class one and class two molecules. Some of these epitopes are shared, which makes it a little bit easier. So the epitopes may be expressed at HLA A, HLA B, or HLA C. So if you carry it here or here or here, it doesn't matter because if I don't carry it and the donor does, then it's seen as a foreign epitope. But the fact that they're shared now makes even makes matching even simpler. At class two, they're not so widely shared. So you can see DR beta one or DQ beta one, DR, DP. Most of them are shared within the gene loci as opposed to class one. But now we have a very good understanding of the targets that we really want to match for and where they lie. So a key question is how are they distributed in the population? The top two graphs shows the distribution of the allele frequencies, class one and class two. And you can see in our population, while there are a few that are reasonably common, let's say 30% is the most or a bit more than 30% for class two, the vast majority of alleles occur with very low frequency, less than 5%, less than 1%, less than 0.1%. So there's an unequal distribution, it's loaded to one side. Whereas when we look at the epitopes, now the epitopes are distributed much more frequently in our population. Some are seen in nearly 100% of people, and they're distributed in a much more linear fashion. So again, not only are there fewer epitopes, but they're more universally distributed, and they are more common in our donor and recipient populations, so that we, again, have great confidence that we should be able to match them. When we look at the distributions in the donors and recipients, they seem to be very, very close indeed. We see no material difference in population frequency between them. So then we can begin to model what might happen. We can look at the actual epitope differences between donors and recipients in our population. These are class one, class two, uh, DR, DQ, DP. And we can see in the real world, there is a substantial difference because we tend not to match very tightly for HLA as most groups across Canada do. So we might have a difference at the epitope level, the cumulative epitope level, 30 or 40 epitope mismatches, which is quite a lot. But if in fact we try to match, we can actually model it. We can show that we can reduce the mismatch quite dramatically down to single digits. And if we look at some of the important gene loci themselves, which now are from a whole variety of information turning out to be class two, let's say we took DQ beta one, we can show that we have a very, very good chance and over 90% chance that we can arrive at a zero mismatch for every donor recipient combination we propose, which itself would be really, really exciting. But one more important thing, we want to be sure that we have equity retained within the allocation. So we don't want to find we can match a few people really well and then leave everybody else out in the cold. And we can actually look at the probability of matching in a different curve and we can arrive at the right-hand side with a small number of individuals who look to be difficult to match. So let's say 10% of people we think within a couple of years interval, we would never find an epitope match for. So we can identify them right away. And as soon as they come to us in the clinic, we can say, we've typed you, we know you will be difficult to match. There is very little point in waiting for the best epitope match. We can offer you alternatives, living donation, or 
transplantation with a slightly inferior match, you take a higher risk of rejection, but your graft, you'll get your graft earlier. What would you like to do? So now we have the basis for formulating social policy in allocation based upon knowledge. So now we've defined the epitopes for the donors and recipients, and we can sequence our uh, recipients because there is no time rush. It takes us about 10 days to from blood to report for sequencing, which is fine for most of our recipients. We do it, we sequence everybody now. But that's not suitable for our donors, where we have, let's say, a time lag of maybe six hours in which to provide sequence level information. So we have three approaches that we're now just in the verge of publishing, <clears throat> which look as though they will solve this problem. The first two are molecular type approaches using very standard approaches. The first uses a little real time PCR kit called uh, the uh, LinkSeq kit by linkage biosciences, which gives us close to certainly, let me say, intermediate level uh, resolution in about an hour and a half. Not perfect and not by itself sufficient to define the epitopes. And the second is a, a more advanced SSO typing, which is used widely across Canada, which takes a little bit longer, takes uh, four and a little bit of hours, which also gives us intermediate typing close, but not perfect for what we need. But now we can actually advance on this by using imputation methods. So we can take the, excuse me, we can take the data that comes from both of these. We can then use the haplotype matching software, which is available based on very large population data. We can identify a little more closely the alleles, which would fit together because they live together in linkage to equilibrium so we can improve the probability of selecting the right type. And then we can turn to one of the HLA epitope registries and from that sequence data, we can now predict the epitopes, which would be important in selecting donors and recipients. When we look at some of this information, we can see that for much of the work that we would like to do, for much of the prediction we would have to make, we have a very high probability shown by the orange of being able to predict with complete accuracy the epitopes. And we have some very interesting information now, which is just being led by Rob Lusky and team. And it looks as though in the next validation set that we have done with him, we can predict with over 90% accuracy, probably about 95% accuracy now, the epitopes in our donors typed within a five, five hour period. So this means we can type the recipients with full sequence information. We can type the donors with close to sequence information and they will give us the information required for the epitopes to enable matching. But perhaps the most exciting development is the next step in sequencing. So far, we use Illumina-based sequencing, which is the size of a sort of a small oven, um, and it takes us about four days to get the information from that and then to interpret and report. But the next step will in fact be nanopore typing, and here is a nanopore cell, and it's about the size of a flash memory drive. It's literally that small, and you can have versions of this which attach into your cell phone and will give a read off on your cell phone. The beauty about this is that it gives us full sequence information within a period of less than two hours. And we can derive epitope typing now from single donors in about a two hour period. So this is certainly going to take over in terms of donor sequencing, but by virtue of its speed, its resolution, the very long lengths it produces, around 5,000 base pairs compared with 150 for conventional typing. This is probably going to replace conventional Illumina typing uh, for all of our laboratories. Let me move past that one. So now we're also trying to ask what are the what are what are the measures we can use to determine uh, whether individuals require intensive immunosuppression, less intensive immunosuppression. Can we get a sort of blood pressure cuff for the immune response so that we're not guessing all the time. 
and we've looked at a variety of techniques. We've started off with deep phenotyping. And deep phenotyping is very challenging, as those of you who do it will know. The goal is to use flow cytometry to divide the cells into broad groups and then using two-dimensional parameters to divide them into much more sophisticated subgroups and then to look for functional expression of markers on top of these. So you can see by the time you've run through a few of these, you've already forgotten what the beginning points were. It's extremely difficult to keep this in your mind. So what we're doing now is beginning to apply machine learning to this. So we can take all of that data we showed initially. We can now translate it into size, colors, shapes, and next to neighbor arrangements so that we can see what the different groups are. This is done purely by machine learning. This is subdivided with the information from machine learning. And we can now begin to compare controls and uremics across different lymphocyte subsets. One of the interesting things that occurs is that even though there are dramatic differences in the biology of the uremic cell, the uremic cell is a truly sick cell, it's a sick cell syndrome, the phenotypic pop populations overall are not dramatically different. You can see many of the cells represented in normals here are represented the same in uremics, except for certain subgroups which begin to disappear. And as we begin to incorporate the functional uh, markers, we begin to see change, more subtle changes in, in appearance. In essence, what we see in uremia is the equivalent of the aging cell with a reduced repertoire for function. So let's move from that to ask, OK, can we now begin to develop a more sophisticated or more precise marker of the response to the dome? And here we've been looking at T cell receptor gene utilization. So let's just have a quick look. Here is the antigen presenting cell presenting through the MHC, the antigen, and the T cell alpha and beta receptors recognize this and respond. So only a clone which recognizes this antigen MHC combination will respond. So what we'd like to know is, could we use, for example, mixed lymphocyte cultures between the donor and recipient at the time of transplantation to look for the clones which will respond here to the donor differences in the targets and give us a clue to the repertoire of T cell receptor gene utilization that we need to follow? And the answer is yes. So what we have done is a large number of mixed cultures between donors and recipients and looked for the clones which expand. And you can see individual clones expanding here and shown on the right, individual clones expanding in this responder. We have two major dominant clones which expand. In this we have one and in others we have more. So we now begin to get the understanding that we may be able to identify a priori at the time of transplantation. The clonal arrangements which will identify the responder cells so we can look at their frequency. And then as that frequency increases, it would indicate to us that this person is beginning to recognize and react against the dome. We carry it a little bit further forward. We can ask now, can we begin to apply some of this biology to major complications post-transplant, let's say oncology or virology? And the answer is also yes. So we've been working with a variety of structural biology groups around the world. One of the main ones is at the University of Oregon. And we've been asking, this is the hand that holds the peptide. It's also the hand that would hold the viral peptide. Do different receptors, different HLA alleles, recognize different viruses and present them differently? And I won't show you a lot of the data, but the answer is yes. Certain HLA alleles present viral peptides very well so that we would react to them and destroy them, theoretically be at very low risk of infection. Others don't present at all. So now we would theoretically have a lot of virus being produced that we can't get rid of. But one of the most striking uh, findings, which really surprised me a little, is that the HLA alleles, which present viruses very well, tend to present all viruses very well. And those that present them poorly present all viruses poorly. So when we thought about it a little bit more, what we believe is it's related to the width, the so-called promiscuity of the HLA. Promiscuous HLA 
can present many peptides and it doesn't care what virus it is, it will present it well. It binds those peptides well. And those which are very narrow and very restricted can only present very few peptides. So levers at risk. So let's think now about some of the problems we see. So CMV is one of the typical ones. We've been mapping the population in BC and we have about uh, 2,500 patients fully sequenced, followed uh, with deep data over the last uh, 10 years. And we've looked at outcomes, predictors, and a variety of others. And now this is just the impact of one of those factors, CMV viremia and CMV vi this, These are the overall outcomes. CMV itself has some small effect on graft and patient survival. And most of the CMV infection occurs very early. But when you get more than one episode of CMV, you really begin to pay the price in terms of both patient survival and graft survival. So theoretically, it may be now possible to identify a priori those individuals who are going to be at greatest risk for this group because they don't present CMV well to the T cell and so don't respond. And now we need to begin to think carefully, how do we protect these people as we move forward? So the laboratory here serves a lot of roles and not just transplantation or not just solid organ, I should say, but stem cell transplantation, genetic diseases for the province and, the, and many others. And one of the problems that has always faced us is getting results back in time. So in the days when I used to be in the clinic, I would get blood taken in the morning. Then you have to wait for the results come. Usually they come in the afternoon. But for many of the biomarkers that we test, um, risks of drug-induced uh, immune diseases and others, those tests don't come back for several days or a week, which is far too long. So what we're working on now is converting nanopore level typing using new nanopore uh, cells, which I showed you, to provide real-time turnaround for sophisticated genomic assays so that we can get full sequencing for gene prediction within a matter of a couple of hours. So the patient comes in in the morning, seven o'clock, gets their blood taken. By midday, you have the gene sequencing results in your hand. So this would be for post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease risk, char characterization and tolerization, evaluation of the immunopeptidome, post-translational modifications, round through to pharmacogenomic variants and HLA haplotypes, all producing results within about half a day. We try to set up the program so that each new innovation is tested and validated at at least two sites. So one laboratory takes the lead, a second laboratory will do the validation. For the nanopore typing, we've started in Vancouver, for example, and McGill will be doing the validation. For the real-time PCR, the initial studies were done in Halifax and are being validated in Vancouver and many others across the country. For example, for the flow work that we showed, uh, the group, uh, uh, Trisha's group in uh, Edmonton is deeply involved groups in Montreal and many others. And it's worked very successfully so far. So as I come to the end, let me just turn to some of the other areas, the societal aspects of the work that we're doing. There are really four things. The first question is, uh, what are the, what's the legality of what we're doing? What are the ethics of what we're doing? What is the social perception of what we're doing? And what is the economic underpinning of what we're doing? So Tim Caulfield and team, um, uh, Dr. Murdoch and others there have really looked in detail at this aspect, produced a number of really interesting articles on various aspects of the whole question of genomics, advanced precision medicine, and societal perspectives. You see some of them listed here. There's a lot more work ongoing in that area. And the team led by Sterling Bryan and the, his colleagues here has really had the, headed the whole question of public deliberative dialogue. So the goal here is to begin to engage all of the uh, various levels of society in Canada to begin to provide information and feedback. We want to get uh, general expert advisors. We want to get levels of the public who are not necessarily involved 
in transplantation, but are very important and vocal in the healthcare they would like to see. We want those to inform the steering committee and then to develop the planning group. Planning group. So we've reached out very widely. We have engaged uh, all classes of society. We've engaged First Nations and non-First Nations. We've engaged people from all of the provinces in different walks of life and have begun to develop educational materials for them so that they can make, develop some expert knowledge and then feed back their information to us. Then our expert advise, advisors include not just patients and potential living donors, for example, but others within the healthcare core who can provide information to us. The timeline for this started in August this year, and we hope by the end of this year to have our policy panel discussions well underway, and then for the beginning of next year, a completion and report of this particular aspect. And this then is turned into the economic underpinning. So we're using a, a discrete event simulation model that, uh, that Sterling Bryan and his colleagues are working on, which will take the pre-transplant phase and the post-transplant phase. It will deconstruct each into its multiple component actions around which various ranges of probability can occur. And then we will try to define from the historical data we have here and across Canada, the probabilities or the range of probabilities that each event will occur. And then we can apply cost vectors to each of those. So we can build a model that can be used not just for one province, but essentially for all of Canada for any changes in transplantation practice as we move forward into the future. So I don't think Ruth has been able to join us yet. I haven't heard her. Ruth, did, did you manage to escape? No. So then I will just spend a couple of minutes on the work that Ruth has been doing. So Ruth has done a really interesting uh, set of work. She has taken the US data set and begun to distill that to validate the information that we're obtaining from Canada. So from the US data set, she has imputed the epitopes, the alleles first, then the epitopes which were involved, and begun to look for the relationship between epilet mismatches and outcomes, and to try to define the probabilities for matching for different individuals carrying different epitopes. This has been a huge amount of computational work, and she already has some really interesting articles out. Uh, and briefly, they show that as we, exactly as we saw from the Canadian data set, there are some individuals who will be very easy to match at the effort level, and there will be some who will be much more challenging to match at the effort level. But in addition, it shows that from this 150 epilets or so, which we define as being antibody-defined epilets, there are probably a subgroup of them which are particularly important. And from Ruth's analysis here, she defines 15 of them which are critically important. Now, we need to validate that from the Canadian data set, and we need to know precisely what these are and precisely where they lie on the molecules themselves. But many of these, of course, lie in the class two molecules, which from all streams of information now appear to increasingly be the most important uh, differential epitopes in terms of transplantation. So the data that we have, I won't go through all of Ruth's slides, except to show that she shows exactly from the American data, the same levels, same consequences, with the numbers of epilet mismatches, which are seen that we see in the Canadian data. She's begun to look at ethnicity as one of the important determinants of what the matching uh, potential will be, and has distilled this very large US data set to begin to look at the probability of matching according to certain groups of epilets within. So I'll draw it to a close because we have, that leaves a few minutes for conversation. And I'd like to, first of all, thank everybody in Edmonton and around Canada who has participated with us on behalf of this, uh, this program. 
and particularly our colleagues in the US, in the European Union, and in the UK, who have been very active members as we've moved through this. We have two years left to go, and we hope that by the time this uh, grant comes to an end, we'll be able to not only have established with certainty or solid confidence all of the um, all of the basis for epitope matching, the costs and the consequences, but to have put in place a, um, a proof of a concept program to begin to deploy epitope matching across Canada. So let me stop and thank you again for inviting us to talk today. Dr. Keown, thank you so much for that talk. That was utterly fascinating. There's so much exciting work going on there. And it was really, um, really interesting, exciting to hear about all those developments. You're very welcome. <clears throat> I do want to acknowledge here just off the top uh, our generous sponsor of all of these talks that's Paladin who supports all of the ATI seminar series. And yes, as, um, as mentioned here in the chat, if anyone would like to ask a question, you can do so here in the chat, or you can raise your hand and you can ask the question yourself. Uh, we've got two questions here. The first one from uh, Andrew Massoud, Dr. Kiel. Question number one says, where do we stand in terms of identifying the impact of the HLI epitope post-translational epigenetic modifications on the translated protein levels in determining the transplantation rejection outcomes? So we're actually at the point of trying to target that now. We, we know all of the epitopes which are involved. We know where they lie. We know combinations which are important. But this question of epitope dominance is really important. There's a very strong feeling among many people now that we can actually reduce the 150 to a very much smaller number of true immunodominant epitopes. But what those are is still elusive. So we're, uh, a lot of work has been done by Franz Klass and his colleagues in this area who have reduced them even further. I'm hoping that within the next year or two, some of this information will become available to everybody which will really move us forward. And there's a, a second part to Andrew's question. Question two here, it says, what do we know about the safety of CRISPR or Cas9 genetic engineering in particular for the epithelial engineering if applicable? And the answer is nothing. Although there's a lot of excitement in this area and there's clearly the possibility of, of mutating the genes so that we produce, for example, null alleles at almost all loci we don't know what the consequences to the organ are if it's not protected by the ability to present various peptides through its HLA. Um, a question here from Laurie West, and then we'll come to you next, uh, Phil, down at the bottom there. Um, Laurie is asking if you can comment on opportunities for expansion into heart, lung, liver um, with kind of rapid timeframes for analysis. Yeah, with pleasure, Laurie. Uh, when we first put the proposal to Genome Canada, when we were actually preparing it, we had included other organs and we were very, very strongly advised to make it intensely specific. So all the things we thought that were exciting about hearts and lungs, they, they advised us to strip out. But having done that, now we have the ability to begin to get involved in those areas again, and especially having shown to our research oversight committee that we've made good progress and they believe we have. Now is the time, I think, to begin to say to them, okay, we think this will apply in other areas. We think epitope-based matching may be more difficult in other organs only because the numbers of donors and the numbers of recipients are fewer. So we will end up with the issue where, yes, some let's say cardiac recipients can be easily matched, others will be more difficult. Maybe there, there will be ways to approach that. But I think what we see probably applies to most other organs, Laurie, and we're actually looking at this now for the next grant that we have in place in terms of stem cell transplantation. And there's a follow-up from Laurie there. She's asking if you can comment on the role of sex mismatch and other donor and recipient factors in combination with these more refined and sophisticated HLI information. Yeah, we put that into the models, Laurie, but we haven't seen much emerge so far. So Ruth has the bigger data set because she has 100,000 US population data set. Um, so, but so far, I don't think she's been able to derive any additional independent uh, interactive effect of sex with epitope matching. Thanks, Paul. That's very, uh, very interesting work and very exciting. Thank you. You're very welcome. I believe we have a question here for, from Phil. Phil, would you like to go ahead? 
Hi, Phil. Uh, yeah, uh, Paul, this is uh, very exciting and congratulations on this whole project. It was a relating uh, the structure to function in transplantation has been long overdue and uh, thank you for taking it on. Um, in when you're looking at uh, epitopes, uh, there are two recognition systems going on out there. There's and there, there are two effector uh, systems. There's T cell mediated rejection, antibody mediated rejection, and then at the recognition level, there is the antibody system, B cells through um, through antibody production to effectors. But there's also T cells and T cells C MHC uh, uh, peptides probably and other uh, MHC molecules, but it's always puzzled me. And you've got two sets of T cells as well. You've got the T cells that generate the effector T cells, and then you've got the follicular helper T cells. I'm not sure that they use the same recognition of MHC molecules. Yeah. So does the science of, of epitopes and epilet start to recognize the complexity of recognition that's going on, the T cell recognition and the B cell recognition? So a really good question, Phil, and you will know as well as anybody around that uh, we're just sort of at the surface of all of this. So you're right. What we've talked about today is very much the B cell recognition. Will antibodies recognize and bind to these uh, differential epitopes between donor and recipient? Uh, and if, they're, if, if we're matched for them, then is it possible that the B cell will not be activated in any way? It looks as though if we're matched for certain of these, so for example, for most of the T cell epitopes, if we are, uh, excuse me, for most of the uh, DQ epitopes, if we're identical for those, we tend not to gen generate antibodies almost at all, even to other epitopes. But the other side of that coin is the whole T cell recognition. So we've been working extensively with the PERCH group in Europe and trying to repeat exactly the same series of analysis. And the results look remarkably similar. The curves which I've shown you for probability of matching and improved matching, uh, improved similarity by active matching for identifying individuals who are difficult to match you could almost substitute one set of graphs for the other and they look identical. That doesn't say anything about the actual structural biology now, but it just says the two systems seem to work in similar ways. So this is one of our next big steps. What does this mean in structural biology terms? Thank you. You're welcome. Another question here from a different Andrew, as is Andrew Mason. He says, great talk. And he says, for your uh, peptidome sequencing, how do you screen the unknowns? Are they new viruses? And two second part question, do you use the Danish net MHC pan predictor for peptide affinity? Yeah, so the, te the teams working particularly in that have used several of them, including the Danish, area, uh, the Danish net. Um, we, we're, for the peptide recognition, we've worked uniquely with known viruses for the moment, so it's been reasonably straightforward. We have not yet got into the enormous range of self and non-self peptides which can be presented. But from some of the preliminary work, it looks as though the restricted and promiscuous uh, HLA alleles uh, seem to be able to present very broad ranges of peptides which cover um, which have the same similarities. So for example, those which present large numbers of self-peptides or large numbers of non-self-peptides are the ones which present large numbers of viral peptides, which if you think about it, of course, makes common sense. It's almost as though the hands of one are open and the hands of the other are closed. So I can't give a lot of additional information for the moment. That's the area that we're just beginning to work on and move into at the moment but I think it's going to be among the most fascinating areas of structural biology. So Paul, we, actually, we do have a, a pipeline for those. So with immunopeptidomes um, that we've been running uh, and it's based on getting some of the sort of metagenomic sequences from viruses and looking at like, if you would like a pipeline to do that, because you're essentially dealing with people that have infections 
of unknowns that you, <laughs> you don't know about. So if you can quantify and then see what they look like, that would be something fascinating. We'd like to help with if you have an interest. That would be wonderful, Andrew. I think the timing is perfect. So uh, I'll follow up if I may afterwards. We'd love to do that. Please do. And can you just quickly, I'm in clinic, so I missed some of your stuff. Which was the paper that said that uh, good HLA peptides that can pick up viruses, can pick up lots of viruses? It's just coming. We're just sending it off to Nature Communications now, so we'll send you a copy. All right, thank you, sir. That's Very good. Awesome. Thanks. Excellent. Do we have any other questions out there? The last chance here where we have Dr. Kewen here. I have just a, a layperson's kind of question here. You've got such a huge network here of people working on, on similar problems. And I, what I imagine to be a huge accumulation of data. And I'm just wondering what some of the advantages and challenges are with having 70 PIs from 22 different institutions, from different national backgrounds, all kind of working together on this, on, on kind of the same overarching goal. I must say it's almost, um, almost exclusively a benefit. It's wonderful to work with them. Of course, the beauty about this is you get to choose, you know, individuals who would like to work with you, who are friends or colleagues. And it's been a very positive experience and we would love to expand it and move further ahead. The challenge, of course, is organizing big groups. And I think that's going to be the big challenge of science in the future. So it requires a lot of time spent in communication, a lot of, you know, emails, early morning, late at night, phone calls, things like that. But really, I think you can see that this is going to be a wonderful experience for the future. I see here that Ruth uh, just joined. She managed to hop on. Hi, Ruth, if, you, how are if, you, if you can hear us, Ruth, you have just maybe just a couple minutes if there's anything that you'd like to highlight about the project, maybe in just, <laughs> just a couple minutes. Well, I think at this stage, uh... Uh, Paul uh, probably reviewed quite a bit of the uh, stem of this project. Uh, there's a lot of exciting work that uh, has taken place and ongoing. And I think the exciting aspect about this project that as a transplant clinician right now, literally finishing clinic, uh, I feel that the content of this project and the tools that we're developing uh, should actively inform management of patients. So. Uh, that would be uh, my one liner to add to this. Thank you. Yeah, that's very that's very exciting. Can you can you touch on at all what you think are some of the challenges going forward in terms of application? If there's just one or two that. So um, from a challenge perspective, I think we are trying to inform, uh, amongst others, aspects in organ allocation, for example. Uh, and albeit uh, uh, at, in different regions, we consider similar uh, parameters in this context. Again, the fact that uh, organ allocation is regional, uh, uh, there are local practices that are at play. So uh, good communication and uh, identifying similarities uh, and general principles uh, adhered to, I think, are a great opportunity for us to build on as we move forward. Because I, uh, the work that we are pursuing truly informs opportunities to improve outcomes and amongst others to do so, ongoing efforts uh, to share organs across the country uh, would make this uh, uh, a reality. And again, there's a, a good experience. Uh, and this is, I think, the benefit that we have uh, uh, as a nation. Uh, and uh, a certain clinical discipline, the fact that there is already uh, collaboration on a national basis championed by CBS, programs like HSP, the living, uh, the KPD program. Uh, again, those are infrastructures to build on and expand on. Excellent, great. I'm glad you could make it at the end for, uh, <laughs> for a little appearance. Well, thank you guys so much for um, participating in this, this seminar series. It was great to have you here. And um, if there's no other questions, I think we'll end it there. I don't see anything else going on here in the chat. And um, so once again, I'd like to um, let you know that next week we have Dr. Dennis Djokovic. He's um, a specialist in end-of-life care. He's going to be describing the SEND program that's going on in Alberta. So it's the same time, 
same place virtually. And once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors of this event, Paladin, for supporting the seminar series. And of course, thank you very much to you, Dr. Kion, and you, Dr. Safir Pachazde, for sharing that really exciting research that you're doing. Thank you.